Welcome to MAT 2LB booklet number 8 fractions lesson number 6 equivalent fractions. This is the second last lesson in this pretty long unit on fractions. Um, we've looked at adding and subtracting fractions in three different ways. We've got our terminology down and now we are going to look for ways to express and more specifically reduce fractions to their lowest equivalent values. So what does that mean? What that means is that fractions by their nature in that they have a denominator that tells you how many pieces each whole is broken up into it can represent different values depending on how many pieces you're cutting up your whole into so if you look in this understanding section you'll notice that in this very first circle we are broken into two pieces that's what our denominator tells us and we've got half or one out of two pieces there but had we broken up our pizza into four different pieces, now we would have two out of four pieces. But we're still talking about the same amount of pizza with respect to the whole pizza. And this is the, this is the concept at the heart of equivalent fractions, where the amount that you have represented with one half is the same amount proportionally that is represented by two out of four quarters, or as we see in our next pizza, four pieces out of eight, if we were to break it up that way, as they suggest in this third pizza here. So all this really tells us is that sometimes we're gonna have a representation of a fraction that has lumber, numbers that are larger than maybe we want, and generally speaking, when we're working with fractions, we want to express them in the lowest possible form. And that's what we're going to work on today, finding equivalent fractions lowest possible form. So let's have a look at example number one. It says, reduce the following fraction to its lowest equivalent form. So the fraction that we have is 15 over 20 or 15 twentieths. Now, the method that we are going to use to reduce this fraction to its lowest equivalent form is something called the factoring chart. Now, the factoring chart, there's a link on our webpage so that you can get to the factoring chart, but I've included it in this note for myself just at the bottom down here. So you can see that's what the factor chart or the factoring chart looks like. Now, our goal using the factoring chart is to find the largest number that is common to both the numerator and the denominator. So our numerator in this fraction is going to be 15 and our denominator is going to be 20. So we're going to go over to the factor chart and we are going to find 15 and 20. So here is 20 over here and in this box underneath 20 you'll find all of the factors that when you multiply them together will give you 20 and they're paired up. So you'll see that 1 times 20 gives you 20, 2 times 10 gives you 20, and 4 times 5 gives you 20. Those are all the fact, uh, multiples or factors of 20. And then we're going to find 15. There's 15 right there. And inside its box you will find the same thing. All the things that when multiplied together in pairs it will give you 15. 1 and 15 and 3 and 5. And our goal here, so let's jump back up to the question. Our goal is to find the largest number underneath, so among the factors, that is common to both the numerator and the denominator. So the number has to show up under both 15 and 20, and it's got to be the biggest one. So let's jump back to that factor chart and have a look. So you'll notice here under 15 and 20, we there's one under both, so I'll just sort of highlight the ones that we have in common. So there's a one and there's a one. That's just not a very big number. Now under 15 we have a three but I don't see any threes under 20. Under 15, I see a five, and there happens to be a five under 20 as well. Under 15, there's 15, and that one is not common to 20. So the largest value that's common to both 15 and 20 is going to be five, and that is the number that we are going to write down as the greatest common factor. So the greatest common factor equals five. Now the next step, again pretty straightforward, we're going to take the original fraction, that's 15 over 20, and we are going to divide the numerator and the denominator by the greatest common factor, which in this case is 5. And then we do that math. So 15 divided by 5 will give us 3, 20 divided by 5 will give us 4, and that is our 15 over 20 expressed in its lowest equivalent form, 3 quarters, or 3 over 4. And that's, that's the process. So let's try example A again together 
review the steps and then you guys can try B and C and maybe D on your own. So let's go after reducing 6 18ths to its lowest equivalent form. So same thing, we're going to go back to our factoring chart and see what factors of 6 and 18 there are in common. We want to find the biggest one. So let's go back, we'll find 6 and 18. So let's erase the stuff with 15 and 20 and let's go after 6 and 18. So there's 6 and there's 18. So what factors are common to both 6 and 18? So we zoom in, we have a look. Well, 1 is common for sure but that's pretty small. Two is common, is the bigger. Three, also common, and six is common as well. And then nine and 18 will not. So the greatest common factor in this example, and I want us to write that down, the greatest common factor equals six. Now we rewrite the fraction, six over 18. We divide the numerator and the denominator by the greatest common factor, which is six and we do the math. 6 divided by 6 gives us 1, and 18 divided by 6 gives us 3. So our answer there is going to be 1 over 3 is 16 eighteenths in its lowest equivalent form. So what I'd like you to do here is hit pause in the video and I'd like you to try B on your own. And when you've got B all figured out, you think you got it, come on back, we'll see how you did. Okay, you're back. Let's have a look at this one. We've got 12 over 3 in its lowest equivalent form. So we go back to our factor chart. Let's go find 12 and 3. So there's 3 and there's 12. Let's find the factors that are common to both. We'll zoom in here. 1 for sure and 3 for sure. That's really all there is for 3 anyway. So 3 is going to be the greatest common factor. Let's write that down. Greatest common factor equals 3. From here, we, we rewrite 50, uh, rather 12 over 3. We divide the numerator and the denominator by the greatest common factor, which is 3. And now we do the math, which gives us 4 over 1. Or we can just write that as 4. That's a common way to write that in math. All right, so that was example B. I'd like you guys to now hit pause in the video. Try example C on your own. Come on back here when you're all done, and we'll see how you did. All right, you're back. Let's have a look at this one. We've got 16 over 18 going for the lowest equivalent form. Let's try this one again. So we're looking for 16 and 18. So here they are side by side. Let's zoom in and see if we can find the greatest common factor. So they have one in common for sure. They have two in common, not four, not three, not eight or nine or 16 or 18. So it looks like two is actually going to be our greatest common factor. So we should write that down greatest common factor equals 2. Now we rewrite 16 over 18, divide both the numerator and the denominator by the greatest common factor, and we do the math. 16 divided by 2 gives us 8, and 18 divided by 2 gives us 9. So 8 over 9 is the lowest equivalent form of 16 over 18. Last example, D. Hit pause here, try it on your own. When you think you've got it, come on back. We'll see how you did. All right, last one, 21 over 14. Let's jump back to the factor chart. We've got 21 and we've got 14. Let's go find them. There's 14, there's 21. So let's look for the greatest common factor among them. So they have one in common, and they have seven in common. It looks like about it. So seven is going to be our greatest common factor. Greatest common factor equals seven. From here we rewrite 21 over 14, dividing the numerator and the denominator by the greatest common factor, which is seven. And now we do the math, 21 divided by seven gives us three, and 14 divided by seven gives us two. Is it okay to leave this as an improper fraction? Absolutely, no problem with that at all. So this is the end of lesson six. If you're feeling good about this, by all means, head right off to the worksheet. If not, look back through some of the portions of the lesson. Good luck with the worksheet, and we'll see you in lesson number seven.